Well, we're picking up where we left off. We're back in Ephesians chapter number 4. And where we really left off was verse 25. And if you recall, um, Paul was really adamant uh, about the members in the body, how we are to be truthful, we're not to be speaking lies. If you recall, I, I may mention, imagine if, if your body parts weren't communicating with your other body parts. That would, that would present a problem, obviously. And so re, we ought to remember that we are all members within his body. So now we, we continue on. We pick it up in verses 26 and 27. And Paul says, obviously, as you see, quoting a verse quoting actually uh, Psalm 4.4, 4. he says, Be angry, and yet do not sin. Do, le- do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not give the devil an opportunity. So again, he's, he's quoting, like I just said, from Psalm 4.4, 4. and you and I, we can, we can be engaged in righteous anger without it leading to sinful thoughts or sinful actions. We should be able to. Yeshua did it. Um, And and sometimes our society gives us enough to be angry about, right? But we must be careful. must be very careful that it's a righteous anger. We, we We are to be angry at the things that God is angry with. The things that God is saddened by, we ought to be saddened by. The things that he's pleased with, we ought to be pleased with. Uh, In Mark chapter 11, beginning verse 15, uh, the Gospel writer says, Then they came to Jerusalem, and he, meaning Yeshua, entered the temple and began to drive out those who were buying and selling in the temple. Of course, this is the most well-known passage where you want to talk about righteous anger. Uh, He began to drive out those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he would not permit anyone to carry merchandise through the temple. And he began to teach and say to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a robber's den. Notice Notice, if you will, all the nations. Just not just Israel. All the nations. So... Yeshua, their perfect example of someone, and he was angry, and he had every reason to be angry, yet he did not sin. He did not sin. So, Paul likewise, he says, do not let the sun go down on your anger. Uh, There are things to be angry about, obviously. We have to be careful to allow bitterness to get into the heart. Once bitterness gets into the heart, we don't deal with it. (laughs) It's leaven, and it will expand. And it will turn into anger. And I'm not talking righteous anger. It'll be a sinful kind of anger, which eventually turns into malice. The difference between anger and malice, uh, you're, you're, you're not only speaking your anger. It's coming out in actions. It's coming out in action. So he says, do not let the sun go down in your anger. And then we have to be careful as well, because even righteous anger can lead to what is called self-serving anger. Self-serving anger, you may ask, well, what is that? Well, that's called revenge. So I'm angry. Do you have a right to be angry? I have a, I have a right, I have a reason to be angry. But if I'm not careful, I can take that all the way to, I'm going to exact my revenge. And we forget Romans twelve nineteen. Paul says in that passage, Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. That's the, one of the hardest things to do. Because the flesh says, wait a minute, you did me wrong. And so now I'm, go- I'm going to get you back. And, and I, I have to be careful, you have to be careful. It's like this, when, when, when somebody does us wrong, If I want to exact my revenge on that person, you did me wrong. Watch what I'm going to do. In essence, what you're really saying and what I'm really saying 
is I don't trust God to stand up for me and and handle this business in a, in a holy kind of way. I'm uh, in fact, you know what? I'm going to bypass God and I'll just take care of it myself. And we forget God sees it and God is writing it down and no sin will go unpunished. Again, it's either going to be dealt with at the cross or it'll be dealt with in hell. One of the two. So the hardest thing is, man, somebody somebody does you wrong and you know they did you wrong. Okay? Now, if, if it's a loving kind of way and you're able to do it, especially if it's a brother or a sister in the Lord, you, you don't want you don't want that to sit there. You want to make it right. Plus, you want your brother or your sister to grow in the Lord. You want them to mature. You, you, don't, you don't want this kind of action to be repetitive. So you try to make things right. But sometimes it's just, you know what, you just got to walk away. And pride oftentimes doesn't let us do that. Pride is, I'm, gonna, I'm going to deal with the situation. I'm not going to wait for God to deal with it. Because <laughs> maybe God doesn't deal with it in my lifetime. So I'm going to deal with it now. So he says, do not give the devil an opportunity. In other words, don't, don't let the door be open, or don't let the, the door be cracked so Satan can walk in. And he uses the term devil, diabolos, specifically. So he doesn't use the term Satan, he uses the term diabolos, devil, meaning prone to slander. Slanderous, accusing falsely. He's a liar. He's a liar. And so the devil, the liar, will tell you, you need to deal with this. <laughs> and God is saying, oh, no, I got it. Vengeance is mine. I will deal with this. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9. Be of sober spirit. Peter says, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, that liar, that father of lies, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. <laughs> You're not the only one suffering. I'm not the only one. There's others. Right? As long as we're on this, on this sin-sick, loss and dying globe, we're going to be subjected to persecution and sufferings and lies and betrayals and all of these things. So he goes on. He says, he who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. So, and you're going to see this uh, through, certainly throughout in, in, in this chapter four, and definitely we get it in chapter five. He's, there, there's a there's a dividing line. You're going to be seeing a dividing line. Believers are not to act like unbelievers. They're children of darkness. We're children of light. So an unbeliever can be a thief. He's saying the child of God, no, no, no. Steal no longer. You may have been a thief, but now you belong to a new family. You've been adopted into a family with a new father. So no, you, don't, you steal no longer. A thief, an unbeliever, an unbelieving thief has no regard as to how God views his actions. He has, he has no regard. Likewise, he, 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 does, he doesn't regard anybody. They just act. They just do oftentimes without even thinking about what other people think about them or will do. That's how unbelievers, unbelievers just react, and everything is through the flesh. He says, on the contrary, on the contrary, he must labor for himself. We must labor. We labor for ourselves, right? We labor for our families, and we, we labor in order to be able to help others. Uh, what has happened, unfortunately, in, in the society in which we live, it's, we happen, we tend to see what other people have, and we want it. Hey, I've got this car, but look at, he's got that car. I've got this, I've got this wardrobe, but she has that wardrobe. I mean, what, you can go on and on. 
and we see what others have and hey I want it and and suddenly now it's it's always and there's nothing wrong certainly with hey wanting to to have a nicer car or a better running car or it, there's nothing wrong with those things at all nothing here's where the problem lies is where I gotta have it so much I'll put myself into debt if I have to I just gotta have it there's a big difference between you take out a loan for something and you have the money to pay for it every month or you take out a loan and you don't have the money to pay you you charge that thing you charge that credit card you max that thing out and that thing is smoking hot and then you take another one and you just, you just keep on doing and keep on doing it right and then it what happens is it, it's it's you're working and you're working and you're working you're working longer hours and it's more stressful and by the time Friday comes along you get the paycheck and guess what <laughs> before the sun goes down that thing is gone because man I got hit this bill and I had this bill and I had electric and I had phone and I had and on and on and on and what happens is we get ourselves looking as to what other people have and I'm gonna spend I'm gonna spend and then I'm gonna buy I'm gonna buy I'm gonna have to pay I'm gonna have to pay and then someone is in need and because I have no money left because I had to pay all my bills I can't help you and that was never God's intent God's intent was you live within your means you take care of yourself you take care of your family right you give you save gotta save for a rainy day right cars gonna cars gonna break down Appliances may have to may break down something, you know, you're gonna have to replace something. You better have something put off for a rainy day. And then you gotta have something to help other people. If you have nothing left to help other people, guess what happens? Really? You're you're stealing from yourself, and you're stealing your, from yourself an opportunity to help somebody. I wish I could help you, but you know, I'm down to my last two nickels. There was an opportunity to help, and now you deprived yourself of that. So when a person gets into debt, they steal the opportunity to help others who are in need. Second Thessalonians 3, beginning of verse 10, Paul writes, For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. Now such person, persons we command and exhort in the Lord Yeshua the Messiah to work in quiet fashion and eat their own bread. Hey, <laughs> it, it's like we, 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 all, we all have bills to pay, right? We all have, when, when we go to the mailbox, sometimes it is, it is not a comfortable thing to do, and you pull, the, you pull those envelopes out, and they got your name on it. <laughs> your name is in the window, and sure enough, when you open it, there's another envelope inside. <laughs> so, you know they want something. <laughs> so, we, we all got bills to pay, right? As I've said before, I'm not your social director. So if, if, I, if, if someone runs into a jam, someone has an issue or a problem, and hey, we, we've all been there where circumstances of life hit us, punched us in the gut, we weren't expecting it, we didn't bring it upon ourselves. We as a congregation, we ought to be able to, to step up and meet the need. You see somebody, though, who's just being reckless, reckless with their finances they know how to hit the clubs they know how to get the nails done they know how to do this they know how to do that and then all of a sudden they have money for the phone bill or they don't have money for a light bill hey guess what light some candles as far as I'm concerned that, that's your own fault you help we help the people who are in need that's not in need <laughs> you're not in need you just don't know how to, how to how to manage your money so help those that are in need give ourselves opportunities to help other people he goes on verse 29 let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear let no unwholesome word uh, 
uh, the word is sapras. Sapras. It's uh, only used eight times uh, in the Apostolic Scriptures. It means something that's rotten or of poor quality. Let no rotten, poor quality word proceed from your mouth. Uh, your speech can be compared to something that's bitter, rotten fruit to the taste buds of other people. I'm sure we've all been around people like that. Uh, if you've ever been around a person where you know that they, they have a difficult time controlling the tongue, and it's almost you're sitting on the edge of your seat because you, you're hoping, man, I hope you don't stick your foot in your mouth. I think we've all been around somebody like that. Uh, he says, "Don't let your don't don't let your speech be like that, where it's it's a bad taste in other people's mouth." Right? We've all been around somebody who used their tongue to damage other people. We've all done it. We've we've used our our words to hurt somebody. What we should do. You ask for forgiveness from God, you go to that person and say, Hey, I was wrong the way I behaved, the way I acted. And 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 try try to restore the relationship the best you can. He says, So let no unwholesome word that, that bitter rotten word or tasting word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification. Uh, be a positive influence, in other words. When we're engaged in a conversation, it could be talking, it could be texting, uh, especially with social media, it just gives us so many more opportunities. Right? And you type something out, and bam, you hit the send button. Is the conversation edifying? Or is the conversation destructive? Uh be careful. Be careful about phone conversations. Sometimes I like texting because it's all I need. I need you to know this piece of information. And so I give you this piece of information. I found myself in conversations when I, when I wind up calling somebody or somebody calls me and we start talking. And the conversation is edifying, and before long, you can talk about somebody, oh, somebody, they're so good, and they're so good, he's so handsome, she's so beautiful, he's such a wonderful father, she's such a wonderful mother, such a loving couple, but... And all of a sudden, at that point, the conversation turned into what? Gossip. And it was never intended to be that way. And it can, ha it can happen so easy. So is the conversation, when you're on the phone, when you're texting, is it edifying? Is it something that is glorifying God, edifying to others, or is it destructive? He says, so, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment. I think we've all been there as well. Man, I shouldn't have said that at that moment. And what you said was right, what you said perhaps was true, but it shouldn't have been said at that moment. I think we've all been there as well. You said that, and you knew it was right, it just wasn't the right time. And now all of a sudden something was said, and maybe you said it, and it was true, but it was perhaps said in the company of other people, and now you put like a spotlight on somebody. And now, if it was a conversation just one-on-one, -on -one, that would be one thing. But now because it's a spotlight being shown on somebody and you've got an audience, now they feel embarrassed. Now you've got an enemy. So according to the need of the moment, man, should I have said that? I shouldn't have said it at that moment. You may very well have good intentions, but is it the right time to speak those words? He continues, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do your words build people up, or do they tear people down? Continuing, verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now, the Greek begins this verse with chi, which is and. So, 
and, and do not grieve. So everything what we've talked about, good speech, is it edifying, is it glorifying to God, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit. So it connects the thought with this verse. Or I should say, connects this thought with the last verse. So all of these things which Paul has listed grieves the Holy Spirit. When we hurt people with words, lying, slander, anger, uh, leaving that door cracked open for the devil, for that, for the father of lies to come in, stealing, stealing opportunities where we could have helped somebody, but now we couldn't. Uh, nasty words, whether whether they be vocal or whether it be written, nasty words that hurt somebody that don't ed- that do not edify. All of those things grieves the Holy Spirit. To grieve the Holy Spirit means to rebel, to disobey. The Spirit tells you one thing, and you go do the other. It's in, in other words to grieve somebody. You may have heard. Uh, uh, a mother pours herself into into a child, and that child turns rebellious, and that child gets in trouble with school or trouble in trouble with drugs or a gang, and and they say, "Wow, that that mother's heart, she's grieving. She's grieving because there's a pain there. You've hurt you've hurt that mother's feelings. She poured so much into you, and look what happened." And we do the same thing with the spirit. We can grieve the Holy Spirit says in Romans 8, verses 12 through 14, So then, brethren, we are under obligation, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. So you're being led by the Spirit, you're hearing the Spirit, and you hear the Spirit, and you'll be hearing the Spirit more and more and louder and louder when you're more into the Word, when you study the Word, when you meditate and pray on these things, right? When you're, when you're plugged into a local assembly and you have others where you can help edify others and you can put your, your, your gifts to use that God is giving you, all of these things, and you, you're maturing in the faith and you're... And you're, and you're uh, growing and your faith is strengthening, you'll hear the Spirit more and more and louder and louder. So the Spirit of Yeshua prompts you to obey. First Thessalonians 5.19, do not quench the Spirit. To quench means to stifle or to suppress. The Spirit tells you, what are, what are you doing? Why, why are you speaking that way? Why did you spread that, that slander? Why did you spread that gossip or that lie? Why did you say that at that time? And you, you, or, or you shouldn't say that, and you quench the Spirit and you do it anyway. So the Spirit prompts you to obey, <laughs> and your flesh rebels. When that happens, you're quenching the Spirit, and the flesh wins. So this Spirit, right, the Spirit that can't be grieved, is the very Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. It's an interesting interesting term he uses there, sealed. Because in that ancient world, when you had, especially a very important document, or some kind of scroll, something or other, you would use like a wax seal. And that wax seal maintained security, uh, substantiated authority. It denoted identification of the owner when you saw that seal on a document and it was also usually with some kind of a a ring some kind of signet ring or whatnot it was it was basically it was in other words it was like a signature and so Paul is saying you've been sealed there's the Holy Spirit has his signature on you earlier in the epistle Paul refers to the Spirit as a pledge so not only are we sealed with the Spirit, but that Spirit is given to us as a pledge. As I've said before, it's like, a, like an engagement ring. That Holy Spirit is His promise to you that you belong to Him, that you're betrothed to Him, and we will spend eternity with Him, and that Spirit is proof of that. It's your engagement ring. 1 Corinthians six nineteen and 20, Paul says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? 
who is in you, whom you have from God, that you are not your own. For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Every single believer the Father has given to the Son will never, ever be lost. Every single believer the Father has ever given to the Son will never be lost. John 6.39 This is the will of Him who sent me, that of all that He has given me, I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. The Spirit is his seal, his seal of approval, his seal of authority, that identification that you belong to him. So then he continues on, if that's the case, and we belong to him, we belong to a new family, we're not walking in darkness anymore, we're children of light, we have his Spirit, verses 31 and 32, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God and Messiah also has forgiven you. So let's go through these terms real quick. Bitterness uh, involves the use of the tongue. This is insulting speech, uh, belittling someone, making light of someone, either to their face or perhaps even behind their back. Bitterness. Let all bitterness, let all wrath. Again, that's that's an outburst of anger. <laughs> wrath, wrath usually comes after anger, but it's an outburst of anger. It's a quick flare up. If it's a loss of temper, and and you you have this this feeling, I must immediately retaliate. You said something, I say something. That's wrath. Anger, usually thought of as a slow burn. Or you're really, if you're really upset with somebody, you give them the silent treatment, right? They speak to you, you say nothing. You turn around, and you walk away. That's anger. That's not wrath. Wrath is you, you, you lash out. You, you retaliate. But there's an anger. It's a slow burn. The word tends to convey somewhat of revenge. You talk to me, I walk away. Anger. Clamor, clamor, arguing, arguing, going back and forth. Right, a lot of when you hear of clamor, you hear a lot of a lot of noise. Uh, never letting the issue die, that's clamor. Always bringing the matter up to the person's attention. I mean, if it, and it's, I think we've all done that as well. You, you uh, uh, somebody does something, they say they're sorry. And you keep on going, right? That's that's clamor. It's it's you just you just won't let it go. You just won't let it die. I I have to have the last word. I have to have the last word. But I'm sorry. I I, I know you said you're sorry. I have to have the last word on that. And and it's easy to do that, especially with social media, because you 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 send the tweet or you send the text or or whatever. And now the other person, instead of just, you know what, I'm just going to close that out. Nope, I'm going to get the last one. I'm gonna, and all of a sudden it becomes like a tennis match. And you're bouncing this thing back and forth. Clamor. Bunch of noise, arguing, never letting it go. Slander. Literally is blasphemy. Degrading the character of someone. Lashon Hara is, is, a, is a phrase... It's a Hebraic phrase you've probably heard of. Lashon hara is not lying. It's not a it's not a negative lie. Some sometimes people think lashon hara is a negative lie. No, lashon hara is a negative truth. That's a negative truth, but it's negative. And so, hey, your your boss is cheating on his wife with the secretary. And you know it, and everybody knows it, and it's true. And so you take that information and you run with it, and you go telling other people. That's Lashon Hara. And you may say, but it's true, he's cheating on her. Yes, but what are you trying to accomplish by by spreading that information? That's Lashon Hara. That's evil speech. Slander is when you just outright lie. That's lying. <laughs> You're getting a lot of slander and lying. 
uh, out there in social media and media and, and, and in our culture. It's just lies now. It's not even true. They're just slander. And one very well-known cable network has been sued a number of times over the past year, year and a half because of slander. They keep lying and they keep losing millions of dollars in court. Malice. Malice, literally bad things. And in this context of what we're speaking here, uh, bad feelings, right? Bad things, bad feelings, wrong motives. Uh, every other kind of selfish or bad relational behavior is malice. Malice. So those things ought not to be indicative of a child of God. May have been what we were before. But now we're children of God, now we're saved. No, you put that stuff away. What are we supposed to be doing? Be kind to one another. Tender-hearted, forgiving each other. Right? As he forgave us, we forgive others. If, if, if God took my sin, has forgiven me, and cast it out into the deepest sea, then why are you bringing it up? If God has already forgiven me, see? If God has forgiven me, it's over. Be kind to one another, tender hearted. Psalm 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Matthew 5, 23, and verse 24. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. What you want, you want to, you don't want, you don't want bitterness, and you certainly don't want anger between a brother or a sister. You don't want that. You try to do your very best so you're not at odds with one another. That might not mean that there's a restoration. That might not mean there's a restoration in the relationship. There might not be a restoration in the relationship. But that doesn't mean you have to be at odds with one another. And even if that person never actually comes to you and says, Hey, I was wrong what I did. The best thing for you, the best thing for me, is to forgive that person tender-hearted, forgiving each other. They never ask for forgiveness. doesn't matter. I have to forgive that person because, man, i gotta live with, I got to live with myself. I can't have that person living rent-free up, up in my brain. i got to let it go. Romans 5.8, But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Messiah died for us. While we were sinners, He died for us. 1 Corinthians 13, beginning of verse 4. Love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous. Love does not brag, is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And he says, just as God in Messiah also has forgiven you. So, God didn't just take our sins and sweep them under the rug. He forgave us of our sins. It's over. It's over. The, the, the worst, the worst, well, I would say, I can't say it's the worst thing. But I, how about this? Not a very good way to mature eh, is you've done something wrong. You know you've done something wrong. Spirit has convicted you of it. At least I hope the Spirit has convicted you of it. But you've done something wrong, and you act as if you didn't. And you just kind of let it go. At that point, the best thing to do, reach out to that person and make it right. That's the best thing to do. <laughs> but to, 
to say something that is hurtful or to do something that is hurtful. And then you, you're not the man enough or you're not the woman enough to come and sit down with that person and say, hey, listen, what I've done was wrong. And then you just kind of, let, let's just pretend like that never happened. It's, it's going to always sit there. Really, it's like, it's like dirt under a rug. It, it doesn't go away. And eventually, somebody's going to lift the rug up, eventually, because it was never really dealt with. That dirt is still sitting there. So if you have the dirt, get rid of the dirt. Crucify that thing. Romans 5.10, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Colossians 2, 13 and 14. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. It's over. And if... if, if the Lord can do that with us and take our sins and nail that thing and crucify it and it's over with and it's done and I've taken your sins as far as the east is from the west. Think about it. I love that. If you go, on a, if you take a globe and you go north, keep going north, keep going north, keep going north, keep going north, eventually you're going to hit the North Pole, right? And if you keep going, keep going, guess what you're doing? You're going south. <laughs> if you keep going north eventually you will go south but if you keep going east you'll never go west and that's how God deals with our sins it's never coming they're never coming back he's never going to he's not going to take your sins and my sins he's going to throw them in like what we do at Tashlik right we take that bread we throw it out there and then, but what God does is he puts a no fishing sign up. You leave it alone, it's over. So we ought to be doing that with each other too. We forgive and it's over and it's done. That was yesterday. We move on. We press on. Hag in his commentary, last words for the chapter. Hag says, Withholding forgiveness means harboring sin in our hearts. The bitterness that an unforgiving heart nurtures is a cancer that will eventually affect one's entire outlook and perspective on life. Practicing forgiveness, therefore, frees the heart to prevent worship, a joyful spirit, and the ability to enjoy all of the good things God has given us. Finally, a person who knows how to forgive is a vessel fit for the Master's use. He is not self-consumed with the way others have hurt him because he has placed these situations into the Almighty's hands and is content to leave them there. He is not constantly burdened with the offenses of others and is therefore able to bear the burdens of others and in so doing to fulfill the Torah of Messiah. So we have finished up Ephesians chapter 4. And uh, when we gather together next time, we'll be digging into Ephesians 5.